The Ear to Asia podcast is made available on the Jakarta Post platform under agreement between the Jakarta Post and the University of Melbourne. Hello, I'm Sami Shah. This is Ear to Asia. For the first time now, in 2024, Prime Minister Modi leads a coalition government, a truly coalition government, where BJP will rely on its coalition partners to maintain its majority. That, of course, means that it will have to persuade its coalition partners to agree to the agenda that this government is now going to prosecute. And that's going to be difficult. In this episode, what to watch for in India as Narendra Modi embarks on his third term as Prime Minister. Ear to Asia is the podcast from Asia Institute, the Asia Research Specialist at the University of Melbourne. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi and his BJP party may have suffered a degree of humiliation in recent national elections. Yet, Modi has now embarked on that rare feat in Indian politics, a third term as a national leader. What should we expect from it? Modi's last two terms as leader were synonymous with a particular brand of Indian politics, in short, a Hindu nationalist agenda. Yet he'll now be forced to rely heavily on alliance partners in the Lok Sabha, India's lower house, and they are unlikely to be so enthusiastic. Modi may also have to pivot from his decisive and often divisive leadership style if he wishes to push back on the renewed growth of a credible opposition. But let's not forget the real policy challenges facing the Indian government. Despite the BJP's claims of great successes in economic management and India emerging as the world's fastest growing major economy under Modi, issues like persistent inflation and the need to find tens of millions of jobs for young Indians persist. On the social front, ethnic and religious minorities, most notably India's vast Muslim population, continue to face marginalization only heightened by recent BJP policy and tone. Then there's foreign policy, where long-cherished Indian strategic autonomy has to find a way amid adversarial relations with the likes of China and Pakistan. Meanwhile, the shifting climate has meant 50 degree temperatures in Delhi and a looming water supply problem of existential proportions. So what's in store for India under a newly humbled Modi? Will his Hindutva push be placed on the back burner, or will he double down? And how will his new, now minority government take on the array of real issues facing ordinary Indians? Joining me to discuss is a regular guest on the show. Dr. Pradeep Taneja is a senior lecturer in Asian Studies in the School of Social and Political Sciences at the University of Melbourne. Welcome back to Air to Asia, Pradeep. Thank you, Sami. So let's kick off with a very simple and obvious question. Is Modi losing his shine? That's a good question. When you look at the results from the 2024 polls, in fact, the BJP's absolute number of votes that they gained in this election, it increased by about 7 million votes. But in terms of vote share, they had a slight drop of about 0.7%. So One could argue that BJP has largely maintained its vote share. But as a quirk of the India's sort of first past the post voting system, they still lost 63 seats. So 63 fewer seats than they had obtained in the 2019 election. In reality, in parliament, that's what really matters, how many seats you have. So in that sense, yes, there's been a humbling of Prime Minister Modi in this election because He was claiming and his party was claiming that they were going to actually hit 400 seats, 400 out of 543, but they only got 240. So to be fair, they were saying that they will get about 370 and along with their coalition partners, they will have 400, that they will cross 400, but they were stopped at 240 for the BJP. Is that hubris that they went into the elections with, was that reflected in the polling data as well? Well, if you look at the exit polls in India, exit polls are 
conducted by various you know, media organizations, but they cannot be released until all the voters have voted, until the final polling day has completed. And when the exit polls came out, they were showing that, yes, you know, BJP was on track to win 400 seats. Ultimately, most of these media organizations had to eat a humble pie and admit that they got it wrong. In fact, one of the pollsters cried on a TV channel when he realized that they had been absolutely wrong. So what does it mean? Is this then a rejection or maybe a criticism aimed at Modi or is it at his party, the BJP? What was the Indian voter saying? In fact, it's difficult to say what the Indian voter was saying as a whole, because it's a very complex country. In terms of support for Prime Minister Modi, amongst his core supporters, the support remains strong. He's still very popular amongst the core Hindutva you know, supporters. So it's difficult to argue that he's lost a lot of support nationally. He did very well, for example, in the state of Madhya Pradesh, in central India, BJP won all the seats, 100% of the seats. In Gujarat, the opposition, India Alliance won only one seat. The rest were won by the BJP and their allies. So clearly, you know, you have to look at the country in different bits. But it's mainly three states where BJP performed poorly in comparison with its uh, competitors with the India Alliance. Uh, Number one, in Uttar Pradesh. In Uttar Pradesh, which sends the largest number of MPs to the Indian parliament, they did poorly. Uh, They won fewer seats than the opposition did. And in West Bengal, where they had made a concerted effort to try and do well, in West Bengal, the chief minister of West Bengal, Mamta Banerjee, and her party, the Trinamool Congress, did in fact very well. They, they held the fort. And another state where they did poorly was Maharashtra. Maharashtra in the West is generally considered to be the bastion of right-wing politics, but there also they did poorly. So these three states together, I think, have affected the overall result. Because most of the seats that they have lost have been lost in these three states. Let's talk about Uttar Pradesh in particular. One of the big stories at the start of the year had been the Ram Temple built on the remains of an ancient mosque at Ayodhya. Um, Many people thought at the time that this was going to signal a very strong message to the BJP supporters and a pro-Hindutva message to the BJP followers in UP in Uttar Pradesh, signaling that Modi was here to stay. Was that something seen now as a miscalculation on BJP's part? Did the Uttar Pradesh voting public see that as something to reject? Well, Uttar Pradesh is one of the poorest states in India. You know, Although India's economy has been doing well, but North India has not been doing as well as South India. And Uttar Pradesh in particular has not benefited from a lot of you know, new investments in manufacturing. So Uttar Pradesh has high unemployment. Uttar Pradesh is also a complex state in terms of caste equations. And in Uttar Pradesh, voters do tend to vote along caste lines. And all the major political parties, in fact, had fielded candidates based on you know their caste. And these factors are very important in the Uttar Pradesh politics. So let's deal with the temple and the mosque issue. BJP obviously had campaigned very hard on the temple issue. They had promised in their manifesto in 2014, then again 2019, that they will build the Ram Temple, where the Babri Mosque, which was demolished in 1992, was located. And they have completed the temple. I mean, the temple is not completely finished, but Prime Minister Modi inaugurated it nonetheless earlier this year. And there was an expectation that the momentum which the BJP seemed to have gained after the inauguration of the, the new Ram Temple in Ayodhya, that you know BJP will benefit politically from it. That doesn't seem to have been the case. First of all, they did poorly in Uttar Pradesh overall, but also Ayodhya, where the new temple was inaugurated by Prime Minister Modi, comes under the seat of Fezabad. And BJP lost that seat. So in other words, the MP who will now represent the town of Ayodhya in the Lok Sabha and the Indian lower house is not a BJP member. 
So clearly, the voters had other priorities. Voters in Faisalabad had other priorities. The Ram Temple has been built, and I think many of the voters probably said, okay, what next? So it essentially, it comes back to the bread and butter questions. In India, people talk about roti, kapla, or makan. Roti meaning bread, kapla meaning you know clothing, and makan meaning housing. And you add to that employment. And these become the most important concerns of the voters. And as I said, UP is one of the poorest states. And for so many young people, millions of young people in Uttar Pradesh, employment is much more important than the temple. And I think the results of this election show that the voters in Uttar Pradesh have prioritized economic growth, prioritized employment, and of course, prioritized the caste affinity. The big story out of this election was the India Alliance, the opposition alliance that was created by the Indian National Congress. Can you tell us a little bit about that? How successful were they and how likely are they now to stay cohesive going forward? Well, first of all, the India Alliance came together when the major opposition parties, the Congress party, which is a national party, and many of the regional parties, because remember, apart from the BJP and Congress, most of the other parties in India are regional parties, including the communist parties. And they came together to form a coalition. They agreed to to essentially share seats. In other words, they decided that in many of the constituencies, they will decide which party, which of the coalition parties is going to contest, and then other parties will decide not to field a candidate from that constituency. So there was a direct contest in many of the seats between the BJP and the Congress or BJP and other coalition partners. So this actually was one of the reasons why opposition did so well in this election. Now, in terms of cohesiveness, this coalition is not based on any particular ideology because the political parties who are part of this coalition they have their own regional agendas and their own ideologies. So had they actually won this election, it would have been more challenging to stay in power because once you are in power, then there's lots of you know sharing to be done in terms of who gets what portfolios and you know, how much power each of the coalition partners enjoys. But the fact that they are going to be in opposition and Congress party now is going to be the main opposition party, the officially recognized opposition party, means that I think this coalition is likely to last until the next election. So you do think then that they will be able to oppose or provide a challenge to the BJP and its alliances? Well, their opposition to the BJP was the main sort of glue that brought this coalition together. And considering that Prime Minister Modi has been elected prime minister for the third time, that opposition, I think, will continue. And as I said, there may be some smaller members of the coalition who may leave the coalition and join the other coalition, the NDA, the Prime Minister's own coalition. But overall, I think the main constituents in terms of number of seats in parliament, the Congress and the Samajwadi Party, primarily in Uttar Pradesh, they are likely to stay together until the next election. Some commentators have questioned the sustainability of Hindutva or Hindu nationalism as a political driver and vote getter, particularly looking at the outcome of this recent election. What are your thoughts on that? Are they correct? This ideology of Hindu-ness or Hindutva, it has brought a lot of Hindus together who have rallied around the BJP. And I think that has become the core of the BJP. I don't think this core is likely to weaken anytime soon. But when it comes to electoral politics, I think people do consider other factors. So, you know, employment is very important. And this has, in fact, been, you know, the key factor in this election. Although India's economy, as you pointed out at the beginning in your introductory remarks, that, you know, India's economy is now one of the fastest growing economies in the world. So in terms of GDP, India is doing well. But many economists in India have said that India's growth has been jobless growth. In other words, it hasn't created as many jobs as would be expected by, you know, 7 or 8% of GDP growth. And that remains, I think, the challenge of the Modi government. How do you create economic growth and jobs with that growth. In other words, 
India needs to attract more investment in manufacturing. And that remains the challenge. And perhaps we could talk about it later. But the core Hindutva support, I think, remains strong for the BJP. Is this despite the more diverse Hindu landscape that has occupied India for thousands of years? Or has there been a shift towards a more unified approach and understanding of Hinduism in India during the time that Modi has been in power? Hinduism as a faith, as a religion, is a very diverse and very pluralistic religion. And the fact that in the same family, you know, different members of the family, a Hindu family, worship different deities, that they fast on different days, tells you that, you know, it's very difficult to, you know, bring people around a core idea of what it means to be Hindu. So Hinduism is a very pluralistic, very diverse religion. But BJP has succeeded in building a narrative. And this is a process that's been going on for 40 years. In fact, the former senior leader of the BJP, Lal Krishna Advani, who led this campaign, he's now retired, but he played a significant part in creating this narrative of a Hindu identity, regardless of which deity you worship, regardless of which part of India you live in, BJP has succeeded in creating that narrative. And that tells you in 1984 elections, BJP won only two seats. And now it has you know, 240, but it had many more seats in the 2019 election. So certainly I think BJP has tried to craft a narrative that Hindus have been victims of foreign occupation. And when they talk about foreign occupation, they don't only mean the British. They talk about a thousand years of Muslim domination. They talk about the Muslim rulers, the Mughals, and before the Mughals, the sultans of Delhi and and other parts of India. So somehow they have managed to create this very populist narrative that uh, the majority, 81% of the population, are the victims of a minority. And which is, of course, far from the reality, but that's the narrative that they're very successfully created and which has benefited them electorally. So before we move on to some of the more economic policies and changes that might come in the coming days, what do you think the BJP's reaction will be to this election? Will they push the narrative even harder? Will they push the narrative even stronger? Or will they pull back on it and perhaps focus on more practical goals? You know, I was in Delhi when the results were declared, and I was watching on television. Prime Minister Modi, unlike in the past, this time he actually gave a speech to his party room at the BJP headquarters. And many observers were expecting him to essentially offer some sort of apology for not doing so well and for claiming before the election that they were going to cross 400 seats, but they were stopped at 240 But there was no humility in Prime Minister Modi's remarks right after the election results were made public. He said, we have won. We won this election. We're going to form the government. So if we were expecting any, you know, course correction, certainly it has not been clear in the remarks made by the Prime Minister and by other leaders of the party. But it's interesting that the RSS, the Rashtriya Swamsevak Sangh, which is one of the grassroots organizations that backs the BJP, two leaders, including the head of RSS, have referred to arrogance. Without mentioning Prime Minister Modi's name, they have said arrogance is bad for electoral politics. And I'm paraphrasing them, of course. Essentially, they have pointed to the fact that perhaps the government had become too arrogant and they need to be more humble in power. So if that is the perception amongst a core support base of the BJP, I would think that that is also the perception among many of the voters, particularly those who chose not to vote for BJP in this election. So now looking forward, where does Prime Minister Modi need to focus his next term to maintain or even grow his party's popularity back to the levels it was previously? Well, first of all, the reality now is that he no longer leads a BJP majority government. The NDA, the National Democratic Alliance that he leads, that's been there for the past, you know, 10 or more years. But uh, for the first time now, 
in 2024, Prime Minister Modi leads a coalition government, a truly coalition government, where BJP will rely on its coalition partners to maintain its majority. That, of course, means that it will have to persuade its coalition partners to agree to the agenda that this government is now going to prosecute. And that's going to be difficult, particularly on the ideological front. I think the coalition partners, for example, JDU, the party which is predominantly powerful in Bihar, is unlikely to agree to a much more radical Hindutva agenda. Chandra Babu Naidu, the, the chief minister of the southern state of Andhra Pradesh, his party, Telugu Desam, is another key component of this coalition government. He is also not a great, great advocate of Hindutva. In fact, he is one of those people who wants India to be shining, but he is not a great sort of admirer of the Hindutva ideology either. So I think the ideological agenda, the Hindutva agenda, will be weaker in this the five-year term. But Prime Minister Modi would be now forced to think much more about employment, creating employment, because India's economy is likely to continue to grow faster than China, faster than most other major economies over the next five years. But I think the challenge for the government is going to be to attract investment in manufacturing, because you cannot have more than half of your population living in the rural areas, depending on agriculture, and become a developed country. Because Prime Minister Modi has set a goal of India becoming a developed country by 2047. And that would require a move from agriculture to manufacturing. India's services industry is very strong, but most of these people, the hundreds of millions of people from the rural areas are not going to be working in the IT industry in Bangalore or Hyderabad. So majority of these people would need employment in manufacturing, better employment, better paying jobs in manufacturing. The challenge is going to be how do you attract investment, both domestic and foreign investment in manufacturing. Well, would Prime Minister Modi be capable of this kind of coalition government? In the past, he's been able to run a government pretty much how he wants to, given his clear majority. Now, this kind of power sharing, is this something he even has the skill set to handle? Well, so far, he has never had to run or had a coalition government. He was chief minister of Gujarat for more than a decade, and he had a majority government there. He's been prime minister since 2014, and he's had majority government so far. So we don't know how prime minister Modi will function as the leader of a coalition and how he would respond to the demands of you know, coalition partners. For example, when we look at the formation of his cabinet after this year's election, the coalition partners have not been given any of the important portfolios. Most of the important portfolios have been retained by his BJP ministers. So there has not been a lot of power sharing. I mean, there are 11 coalition members in his cabinet, uh, cabinet and the, and the junior ministers, but they've not been given any of the more important portfolios, such as home ministry, finance, defense, and foreign affairs, all of which have been retained by the BJP ministers. And this could be that the coalition partners demanded more support for their states. As I said, the two key coalition parties are from Bihar and Andhra Pradesh. And both of these states need more resources, more financial resources from the government. So it is possible that Prime Minister Modi would offer more financial support to their states, but not make too many other compromises. We'll have to wait and see because it's difficult to say. His style, certainly, his style of governance is very authoritarian in the sense that he rules the cabinet and um, he essentially sets the agenda. He talks directly to the senior bureaucrats in each ministry. Sometimes he even bypasses the ministers and goes directly to chief bureaucrat in the ministry. But I think as the leader of a coalition government, I'm sure there will be issues where he will have to listen to the coalition partners. And particularly, I think Nitish Kumar, the chief minister of Bihar, whose party is also one of the two important coalition members. So the, the NDA coalition has many parties, but the two parties on whose support Prime Minister Modi is relying 
are the two parties of Nitish Kumar and Chandra Babu Naidu. And I think they are unlikely to agree on much of the ideological agenda. You're listening to Ear to Asia from Asia Institute at the University of Melbourne. And just a reminder to listeners about Asia Institute's online publication on Asia and its societies, politics and cultures. It's called the Melbourne Asia Review. It's free to read and it's open access at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. You'll find articles by some of our regular Ear to Asia guests and by many others. Plus, you can catch recent episodes of Ear to Asia at the Melbourne Asia Review website, which again you can find at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. I'm Sami Shah, and I'm joined by politics researcher Dr. Pradeep Saneja. We're talking about what to watch out for in India as Prime Minister Narendra Modi enters his third term of office. During an election season, many of the practical policies that a country needs tend to be put on hold so that the electioneering can happen. Now that that's behind us, what are the real policy challenges facing the new Indian government that it needs to meet with sound policy? Well, one of the first challenge is is economic. I mean, on the domestic front, the economic challenge is the biggest. Even though India's economy is one of the fastest growing the major economies in the world, many, many leaders would give anything to get the growth rate that India has been able to achieve. But the challenge, as I said, is if India is to achieve its goal of becoming a developed country by 2047, which would be the centenary of India's independence, they would have to really transition hundreds of millions of people from agriculture to manufacturing. And that is going to be quite challenging. Although India has had some success in attracting investment, particularly those foreign companies who were focused heavily on China, who had made investments in China, in many cases, production had moved completely to China. Those companies are now diversifying. But India is not the only country which is getting this investment. In fact, some other countries like Vietnam have been more successful in attracting this investment than India. So India will have to create, Prime Minister Modi's government will have to create an investment environment where they are able to offer the right terms and conditions to foreign companies who may be willing to move investment to India. It will also have to focus on skilling up India's workforce. India is supposed to have about 500 million young people who need employment, but who also need to be skilled up. And therefore, there has to be a strong emphasis on skilling up, particularly on vocational education, not so much in university education, but particularly in vocational education, where they need to skill up workers who can be employed by manufacturing companies, whether it's Indian companies or foreign companies. So the right set of skills, which would be needed by by manufacturing sector, I think that would be the challenge for India. The BJP went into the election campaign claiming great successes in economic management under Modi. Will the current approach that Modi had to the economy continue or do you expect to see some radical changes being announced? Prime Minister Modi said he's already consulted with people. He said he's consulted with hundreds of thousands of Indians on his first 100-day agenda and what they want going forward over the next five years. So when the parliament meets we will see more in terms of what the government's agenda is. India has done well, for example, on infrastructure. India has been building new roads and new highways all over India. If you go to India, you see the quality of infrastructure is certainly improved, railways and highways. The next focus, I think, is going to be on urban renewal because the cities themselves need, uh, whether it's clean water, sewage treatment, urban roads, inner city roads. I think there's likely to be more focus on those things, on improving the quality of lives of uh, people. But in terms of economic growth, I think the focus is largely going to be on creating more jobs. And I think the results of this election, the 2024 election, have demonstrated that while many Indians, particularly many Hindus, may subscribe to the ideological agenda, although that's by no means the majority of the Hindu population, but they also want government to deliver on jobs, employment, and inflation. Inflation has been a serious challenge. 
most ordinary people in India have felt that the prices have been rising, prices of food stuff, prices of housing have been rising, and their incomes have not been keeping up. So meeting those expectations, on the one hand, you know, focusing on delivering high employment, employment growth, but also, you know, controlling inflation. That's going to be the major challenge for the government. The other big controversy around the BJP government has been its social policies, particularly regarding minorities, religious and ethnic. Will we see a change in some of those approaches? Has the recent election and its outcome been a message to the BJP that the Indian public is not interested in some of the controversies that have plagued the government in recent years? I think in terms of concrete sort of policies, which may be sort of targeted at at the minorities, Modi government was expected to introduce a uniform civil code. You know, India has separate civil code for the Muslims, and there was an expectation that there could be a uniform civil code. And some of the BJP ruled states had already started you know, introducing a uniform civil code. And there was an expectation that that may happen at the national level, that BJP government may introduce legislation uh, to parliament to bring a uniform civil code. I think that is likely to be more difficult now because Nitish Kumar, particularly whose party is uh, one of the coalition partners in the new government, is unlikely to agree to that. And uh, because if he does, he would be offending a lot of his own constituents in the state of Bihar, but also in other parts of India. So I think in terms of policies towards minorities, there is likely to be a restraining effect on those policies. In terms of what the rank and file members of the BJP do in terms of you know their attitude to the minorities, because remember, in the past, the problem was not so much the policy. The problems were what was happening in various parts of the country, but not being condemned by the prime minister, right? If there were actions taken against an individual belonging to the minority you know, population by a group or individuals, supporters of Prime Minister Modi's party, often Prime Minister Modi would not come out and condemn those actions. And he will simply treat them as a law and order problem rather than a communal problem. And I think those incidents are probably likely to continue to happen as they've happened in the past. Perhaps as the leader of a coalition government, Prime Minister Modi may be now required by his coalition partners to react to those incidents when they do happen much more forcefully than he's done in the past. One of the things you mentioned was a uniform civil code. What does that entail? Well, as I said, India has had in the Indian constitution separate provision for, for example, marriage laws, divorce laws, the civil code The BJP has argued that India as a one nation needs to have one civil code rather than different codes for different religious groups. And and they've had support for it from both their own core supporters and some other communities have said that, yes, the country needs to have a uniform civil code. If a uniform civil code is introduced, which, as I said, is probably less likely now as the Modi government is a coalition government, This would have meant that many of the civil laws would have been sort of made uniform where they would apply to both Hindus and Muslims as well as any other religious groups. Moving away from some of the local problems, what about foreign policy directions? India is in a fairly complicated region with China and Pakistan both having pressures internally and externally in the region. Do you see a change in India's foreign policy approach? Are there any major considerations that are immediate that the BJP government now with its coalition partners has to take into account? I think on foreign policy, we will see continuity. In fact, if you look at Modi government's foreign policy over the last 10 years, that also is a continuation of the policy, broadly speaking, of the previous government, of the Manmohan Singh government before 2014. So in terms of India's foreign policy, India is unlikely to choose between Russia and the United States, for example. India's foreign policy, as it's been described by the foreign minister who's been reappointed by Prime Minister Modi, is that India believes in multi-alignment. 
So India has shifted away from non-alignment to multi-alignment, that India would uh, align with anyone depending on what's in India's national interest. So India's policy has been clear since 2022 when Russia invaded Ukraine in February 2022. India has refused to criticize Russia. Prime Minister Modi called for an end to this war by saying to President Putin himself that this is not an era of wars. But India has refused to condemn this Russian invasion of Ukraine. And I think that is unlikely to change. India will continue to maintain good relations. Indo-US relationship, I think, is likely to be strengthened further, but not at the cost of India's relations with Russia. So India will continue to chart its own course in terms of foreign policy. And we will see, I think, more of the same rather than any significant change in foreign policy direction. This summer, like in previous summers, India has also undergone extreme heat waves. To what degree does the environmental and climate crisis that India is at the centre of figure into political discourse? Prime Minister Modi, even over the last 10 years, has emphasized that his government is working towards, uh, for example, developing renewable technologies. India formed an international solar alliance along with France and Australia is a member of that alliance too. And India has been investing very heavily in renewable energies. So climate change and transition to renewables, transition away from fossil fuels, is part of the Indian government's agenda. But Indian government, I think, is unlikely to make any compromises on economic growth. Prime Minister Modi, I think, has said this before, that government is willing to abide by the commitments that it has made in international organizations, in international conventions, when it comes to transition to clean energy. But at the same time, it will prioritize economic growth. It will prioritize jobs. And we are going to see India continue to argue that, yes, India is willing to share its own responsibility when it comes to mitigation you know, of uh, climate change. But at the same time, it will not do it at the cost of economic growth and economic development. So India has maintained this you know, the common but differentiated responsibility idea. India will continue to stick to it. But at the same time, I think Prime Minister Modi will continue to attend international meetings on climate change, COPs and others, and continue to maintain that position, which has been appreciated by the United States and other countries. Could India do more? I think certainly India could do more. But the government would be reluctant to be pushed into pursuing a more ambitious agenda than it has already agreed to. Prime Minister Modi's personal charisma, his personal projection of his individual brand of politics has been a political phenomenon, not just in India, but studied abroad as well. Will that change now, given the election outcomes and given what many people are expecting a coalition government might put pressures on with regards to his own brand of politics. Do you see him shifting? Do you see him moving? Or do you see this being as a doubling down, perhaps, on what makes Modi Modi? That's a very good question, Sami. Prime Minister Modi had made this election about himself. The 2024 election, more than any other election, was about Prime Minister Modi. And that was based on the sense that Prime Minister Modi is so popular with voters that he could get away with anything, and that his name alone was enough for BJP to gain votes. That clearly has not been the case. Prime Minister Modi, for example, you know, he talks in third person. He talks about Modi. He himself says Modi will do this and Modi will do that. And he promised many things during the last election. And they were phrased as Modi's guarantee, that these were guarantees from Modi personally. And that obviously was meant to persuade voters to trust him, trust him that if you vote for him, if he becomes the prime minister again, he will deliver on all those promises. I think that currency, the Modi currency, has been devalued clearly, you know, as indicated by this election. Also, I mentioned earlier 
some of the comments made by the RSS leaders talking about arrogance. I think that also is a reference to the fact that the BJP relied so heavily on Prime Minister Modi's brand and you know, Prime Minister Modi's popularity. So clearly, I think there's going to be a more collective leadership, partly because of the compulsions of a coalition government, but also I think within the BJP, other leaders would probably emphasize that BJP has never been about one person. You know, one of the things about BJP as a party is the right from its formation, BJP was a cadre-based party. Like the communist parties in India, the BJP was always considered to be a cadre-based party. But over the last 10 years, it has become more and more about one person, about the prime minister. And I think the results of this election show that there is going to be a much more collective leadership because clearly election results have shown that over-reliance on one leader or one person is not advisable. And that did not bear fruit in this election. And therefore, it's likely to have some impact at least. So then for critics of the BJP government, is there still reason to fear a shift to a one-party rule and increasing illiberalism in India? Or is there now a cause to be cheerful about democracy? Well, any democracy is always a work in progress. Democracies can go up and down, you know, in terms of progressive agendas. And I think Indian democracy is no different. The lessons we can draw from these elections are the 2024 election are that we need to, as a society, as a civil society, people need to be constantly on guard about erosion of civil liberties. And I think the results of this uh, 2024 election show that this clearly has been the case. Civil society in India was not terribly happy with the way some of the civil freedoms had been eroded, civil rights had been eroded. And I think there has to be a course correction. And the fact that this is a coalition government, some of the coalition partners, particularly the two parties I mentioned earlier, that they are likely to insist on restraining the government when it comes to erosion of civil liberties. The discussions around India and Indian politics in the international media in the last few years have really talked about, is this the death of democracy? Is this going to see an end to Indian democracy? Do you think this election outcome shows Indian democracy is more vibrant and more robust than previously believed to be so? I mean, in terms of representative democracy, certainly the results of this election show that Indian democracy remains a vibrant democracy. Elections are held every five years, both for for the federal parliament and for the state parliament. So um, in terms of representation, I don't see any, any real threat to democracy as we know it. And I think clearly, despite the claims of Prime Minister Modi and the BJP that they were going to have an absolute majority, two-thirds majority in parliament, uh, they have been humbled at this election. And that, to me, is an indication that Indian voter is a mature voter. Democracy is is very well entrenched in the Indian system. And I don't think there is any threat to democracy as such. And one final question. Narendra Modi is 73 years old. One of the big discussions about the US election has been the age of the leaders there. Who's next in the BJP after Narendra Modi? Is there even a discussion about succession in the party? You know, one of the the pitfalls of a one-man leadership is that there is no succession planning, that everything depends on that one leader, and Prime Minister Modi is being that leader. There are obviously aspirants who would like to be leader after Prime Minister Modi. For example, one of the one of the BJP leaders who was being touted as a possible successor to Prime Minister Modi is Yogi Adityanath, the chief minister of Uttar Pradesh, the monk who wears saffron clothes. And he was promising to deliver all 80 seats to the BJP in this election. And his state is where BJP has performed the worst. So I think his personal chances of being a successor to the prime minister have been significantly adversely affected. So while before the election, many commentators were talking about Yogi Adityanath as a possible successor, 
I think his chances have been very seriously dented by the poor performance, poor showing of BJP in Uttar Pradesh. Another person which is often mentioned is Amit Shah. Amit Shah is Prime Minister Modi's right-hand man. They worked together in Gujarat when Prime Minister Modi was Chief Minister of Gujarat. When Prime Minister Modi became Prime Minister in 2014, Amit Shah became the leader of the BJP. Later on, he became the Home Minister. Home Ministry is the most powerful ministry in the Indian system. And he's been the Home Minister since 2019, and he's been reappointed to the same role. But whether he would succeed Prime Minister Modi remains to be seen, whether he would be acceptable to other other leaders of the BJP and the coalition partners remains to be seen. But there is clearly no one anointed successor. Prime Minister Modi is not talked about a successor. He is not groomed a successor as such. So it's difficult to say as to who is likely to be his successor. But amongst the people who have been polled by polling agencies, I mentioned Yogi Adityanath, Hamid Shah, and the Minister for surface transport, particularly the building highways, Gadkari, Nitin Gadkari. He's also very popular amongst ordinary people. So these are the three people who are often mentioned as successors to Prime Minister Modi. Our guest has been Dr. Pradeep Taneja, who is a senior lecturer in Asian Studies in the School of Social and Political Sciences at the University of Melbourne. Thank you very much, Pradeep. Thank you, Sammy. Ear to Asia is brought to you by Asia Institute of the University of Melbourne, Australia. You can find more information about this and all our other episodes at the Asia Institute website. Be sure to keep up with every episode of Ear to Asia by following us on the Apple Podcasts app, Spotify, YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. If you like the show, please rate and review it. Every positive review helps new listeners find the show. And please help us by spreading the word on your socials. This episode was recorded on the 18th of June, 2024. Producers were Kelvin Parham and Eric Van Bemmel of Profactual.com. Ear to Asia is licensed under Creative Commons Copyright 2024, the University of Melbourne. I'm Sammy Shah. Thanks for your company.